I'd like to bring on camera now, Mark Mulligan. He's going to be our next uh, uh, keynote here. He's talking about new growth drivers in the music business. Mark Mulligan's with Media Research. He's the managing director and analyst, and he did an amazing keynote at our conference last year. It was our opening keynote. It set the tone for everything. Mark, it was brilliant, and we're super excited to have you. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Thanks, Dimitri. How about you? I'm doing great. It's 2 o'clock where I am. Uh, it's 7 o'clock where you are in the UK, right? Yes, indeed. Yeah, so thanks for making the time. I'm just going to hand it over to you. Brilliant, thanks. Well, I'm actually going to start. Dimitri started the presentation, the, the conference, by briefly putting on a mask. I'm going to upstage him. This is a mask. Socially distanced that. Okay, I've got that out of the way. I've been meaning to do that for ages. So I'm going to talk not about ancient history, but about the future of the music business. And uh, let me get my slides up and running. Okay, um, and I have just been given instructions to close down my video so you can all see my slides nice and properly. Here we go. Growth drivers, what's next for the music business? Okay, so why am I talking about growth drivers? Quite simply because we have got two things happening. One is this long-term effect, which we all knew was coming, which was streaming was going to reach a degree of saturation in a lot of mature markets. Um, we were going to get to the stage where we needed to find out what was going to come next. Because everybody has been so busy trying to get everything they can out of streaming, make it work properly, understand how the mechanisms of it work, make sure we maximize all the subscribers and all that sort of stuff. Nowhere near enough attention was put into finding out what plan B was going to be. And this is a lot like what happened 20 years ago when just before the CD went into free fall, it was booming and nobody had worked out a plan B. Then comes along COVID and next will come along a recession. And suddenly we're having to think about a plan B in large part because live music is gone and a huge part of income for artists is gone. And that has knock on repercussions across uh, the music business. So here's a few stabs of what growth drivers could be. Um, you'll see it's live music, fandom, YouTube and creator tools. So you might say YouTube, that's not a growth driver, but you'll see why. Um, first of all, going to talk about bit about some of the key market dynamics we should be paying attention to right now. Then some uh, exploring how COVID is reshaping the market in terms of everything from artist creativity through to, uh, to business models and entertainment revenues, and then on to the growth drivers. So first up, this is what the music business looked like pre-COVID. So we're looking at here, this is publishing, music sales, live merchandise sponsorship, the main bits of what we consider to be the music business. In year 2000, you could see that uh, you know recorded music was the dominant revenue source, and then Napster happened. CD sales started to decline. We basically spent a decade and a half with the music recorded music business trying to work out um, how to respond to this whole new thing about people being able to choose the music they wanted on demand and not and you know and not even paying for it. Meanwhile, while music lost revenue, live music took it. And live music did more than just replacing dollar for dollar. It grew uh, and filled this vacuum and grew the market beyond, you know, sort of where, where recorded had, had it. And then we get to 2015, the recorded market starts to return to growth and the whole market you know, grows because live is still growing too. But then COVID happens and suddenly everything needs reassessing. So this is really three views of what 2020 could look like by the end of it in terms of where revenue goes. Um, and we see probably uh, something like six, seven, eight percent decline in publishing. Recorded music should be should still be growth. It should, you know, maybe two or three percent, but not this sort of eight, nine sort of percent growth we've had year on year for uh, in the last half a decade. Um, and uh, live absolutely decimated. And with live going, merch has been hit hard. And with the ad market softening, uh, sponsorship too. So that's sort of the negative side of it. We've got a market which is definitely going to be contracting. This is less money being spent by consumers, less money that's making it back to creators. And this is why we need to have growth drivers. We need to work our way to pick a, a way to pick ourselves out of this. So on to streaming, you know, as we're sort of, you know, getting into maybe what we sort of consider the last lap. If some, no, none of you, if some of you haven't seen it yet, take a look at Will Page's uh, piece in Billboard earlier this week on uh, market saturation. 
he, he really sort of builds this idea about us being on the last lap of the race in a lot of mature markets. And that last lap might look a bit different from what's happened over the last couple of years because it's, it becomes more difficult when you're trying to get those last people to subscribe. And it may be that we're not just looking at the current market share is what the market share is going to look like by the end of it. Uh, at the older age of the age spectrum, end of the age spectrum, what we have is Amazon essentially expanding the total addressable market by getting households who sort of fallen out of contact or out of love with music, getting back into it by having, you know, an echo in the kitchen and listening to music while they're cooking, etc. And then at the younger end, YouTube has been this huge success story the last couple of years after, you know, just way too many years of really not being able to deliver on subscriptions. You might say that Heart wasn't in it. It certainly is now. Um, but it may be the best place to convert <clears throat> to convert Gen Z to subscriptions. If you think about, imagine a 19-year-old who's been using Spotify free since she was in, in the playground. So she's become completely accustomed to Spotify as being this thing that, that's free. She's also become accustomed to, of course, YouTube being something that's free, but she equally uses music for Spotify and YouTube. It's about 70% of teens use Spotify and YouTube for music. So they find something different from both of them. But YouTube is a bigger part of a bigger part of her life because she's also watching her favorite social talent there. She's maybe watching some gaming videos, whatever it might be. So it's a much more natural step to go and pay for YouTube if she's going to go and pay for anything. So that's just an illustration of as we move into this latter stage of streaming, do not expect it to simply be the, the, the runners at the front now being the ones who finish the lap, last lap fastest. Another interesting thing is about um, what is motivating artists at the moment. So this is from one of Midia's um, artist surveys we filled a couple of times a year. Uh, we, we basically asked them a whole bunch of questions about what they're doing, what they aspire to. And when you look at the aspiration here, you know, the whole thing about signing to a label, even a label service deal or an independent label, it's just not at the front of the mind of why they're doing this. You know, becoming respected and recognized in their scene, it, building a loyal fan base. Now, does this mean that if a record label came along and said, I'm going to give you a big fat advance and make you super famous, that they're going to say no? Probably not. But it does reflect that. If we'd asked these questions five years ago, even, we'd have had a heck of a lot more people saying, I want to succeed. I want to get signed to a label because a label, it still has that um, stamp of success. I've made it. I've been signed to a label. But this new generation of artists coming through are thinking about the world really differently. And then the other side of the equation, you know, where we find music. So here's the interesting thing. Radio has been in decline for years. Radio has lost you know, massive swathes of its young audience is, you know, is largely left with a sort of an older audience has been hit hard by COVID because people aren't in the car as much. And yet it's still the number one music discovery um, method, streaming only third. Now, streaming has grown. That blue bar is the 2020 value against red in 2019. So it's a really strong growth, but it's still way behind. And that is because there is a big difference between hearing a bunch of new songs and discovering music. Radio still adds all of that context. And crucially, it adds repetition. The thing about radio is it is programming led. The thing about streaming is it is user led. So the algorithms watch what you do. If you skip a song after 30 seconds, you're telling it, don't play me this song or music like this again. If you don't add it to collection, if you don't share it, don't like it, whatever it might be, you're telling the algorithm that this song doesn't matter as much to you. But you might hear a song on the radio once not like it much, hear it again, it begins to grow in you. By the third time you've heard it, you're often adding it to your collection on Spotify or YouTube or wherever else. That's one of the things which is missing at the moment from streaming services. It's another reason why we need growth drivers. It's not just about how do we get more music revenue into the mix. It's also how do we make people fall in love with music more rather than it simply being this torrent of sound that happens in the background. So on to COVID. Uh, and so, you know, the sections here are relatively bleak. And then I'm going to go into all the having emptied the glass, start filling it up again. What we're looking at here is the Q2 2020 revenues for Disney and for Live Nation. The blue bar is how much they earned in Q2 2020. The red bar is how much revenue that they'd earned one year before in the same quarter that had disappeared. So in one quarter, these two companies lost nearly $10 billion of consumer entertainment spend. 
in one quarter. Over the same period, Home Depot increased its revenues by 7.2 billion. Now, no, this does not mean that everybody who couldn't go on holiday to Disneyland then went and decided to do up the bathroom. But there is this sort of shift of spending where people who were no longer able to go and do the things that they would normally do or the things they saved up to have money in the bank. They're going to go and do lots of other things that they can do when they've got so socially distance uh, constraints around them. And um, question is, does this spend come back? And if it does come back, how quickly? I think when we think about the impact of COVID, that it's changing behaviours and no doubt about it, you know, more of us spending time at home, more so in some countries than others. Um, some of those behaviours will quickly disappear as we go back to normality. Some of them will have a long term legacy. One of those, which is crucially important to live music and entertainment as a whole, is more of us will spend more of our time working from home spending less time commuting in. And that's going to change the nature of cityscapes. You know, we're going to have less footfall during the day and during the evening in the centre of cities, which means bars and restaurants and nightclubs and venues. We're going to have less um, passing trade, which means that, you know, you, you get this fragmentation of entertainment. There's just so many things which can be impacted by this changing of how we behave as humans as a, you know, as a response to this pandemic. The other thing that's happening, unfortunately, is as we move towards this second wave that is happening, you know, and we may well have multiple waves beyond, but the second wave is going to coincide with the recession. Now, the recession was always on its way, um, and, and unfortunately, COVID just catalyzed it. It's uncharted territory in modern, you know, e e economics, this idea of what happens when there's a pandemic and a recession at the same time. So anybody who tells you that they know what's going to happen is lying. Uh, what we can do is have some best guesses. One of the things that we try to do to help us get a sense of what those best guesses might look like is we ask consumers about if you have to reduce your entertainment spending because of your financial circumstances change, what would you do? So you see people are doing the easy stuff, eat out less, go out less, because that doesn't mean stop doing those, it just means you do less of them. But cancelling a music subscription, cancelling a video subscription, that's, that's final. If you cancel your subscription, the only way you get access is by resubscribing. So we've got round about a fifth of people say who are music sub subscribers saying they've cancelled the music subscription. This does not mean that we're going to see a quarter of the subscription base disappear. What it is is an indication of an illustrative indicator of what people think that, you know, where they think they will be um, cutting their spending, you know, what they do save money. And it's dead easy to cancel a music subscription and still get a great music experience from Spotify free, from Pandora, from SoundCloud, from YouTube, wherever it might be. So this is something subscriptions have been really resilient during lockdown. They've grown during lockdown. During a recession, churn rates are going to go up. So at the very best, we're going to see a further slowdown in subscription growth. We also ask people about how do you think you change your behavior post lockdown? when you can go and do whatever you want, wherever you want, without social distancing restrictions. And it's actually, when you look at all the things that we've got pent up demand about, you know, wanted to go out to bars and clubs and live music, live sporting events, net, net, more people say that they will not do it. And if you think about that, that's because people still have a lot of reservations about, you know, about the health risks. Um, think about live music, how important older consumers have been to, to the growth of live music over the last five to 10 years. These older people with the spending power to be able to buy those expensive tickets, particularly in the resale market. And if you're over the age of 40, every six years extra of life that you have, don't the risk of, of complications from COVID. So older concert goers are just going to be much more reluctant to go out and take the risk. So that's all the bad news. Let's move into some of the good news. Live music has been impacted in three different ways by lockdowns uh, and will be, you know, for at least um, the majority of next year. We we think at Media and really live music, assuming third peak will be 2022 before we really see things returning to normality. So we've seen the format, the audience and the business model all hit. You're all capable of reading, so well, at least I hope you are, so I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. But I think one really big thing to take out from here is what is happening to small venues. So small venues, then they're, they're not like a live nation. They can't go to a Saudi fund and sort of get money to help them through. You know, they don't have access to bridge financing. They're relying upon uh, grants you know, to, and subsidies to get them through. 
but many simply won't make it. And even if they do make it, if they have to have socially distanced concerts, many of them are too small to be able to make a socially distanced concert actually work financially. And besides, how do you socially distance a mosh pit? So I think this is going to be a gaping hole in the in the live music music ecosystem. Once you know, not just during lockdown, but post lockdown, is it's going to be harder as an emerging artist to get going because there are going to be fewer places, fewer venues for you to play at. So right now we've got all of these great alternatives, you know, and we heard before, you know, talk about live streaming and how it's dramatically changed. And this is true, but it's a really big problem. COVID came too early for live streaming. If you think about, say, video conferencing, so we're all doing bucket loads of video conferencing now. That was already an established sector before COVID. So the technology was ready for prime time. The services and the value propositions were ready for prime time. It was ready for that accelerated demand. Live streaming was not that way, in large part because the traditional live business did all that it could to make sure that live streaming never got anywhere. So now we've got this, the positive side is a massive amount of innovation, all of these different sort of things that you can do for a virtual concert. The downside is, is this really huge amount of fragmentation. There's uh, competing uh, business models. Uh, you know, there's some of these services are trying to piggyback on the uh, artists to get audience when the artists want the platforms to bring them audience. There's varying levels of quality. Um, but I'd say the two biggest things, the two biggest mistakes which have been made around live streaming. Number one, live is the pinnacle of music spending. It's the bit we spend most on per minute because it's a scarce commodity. So as a result, that's why most artists who are established see the majority of the revenue coming from, from live. And yet what we're doing on, online, we're giving it all away for free. You know, this is exactly what happened with Napster. It spent 15 years for the industry to re-educate people that actually music online shouldn't be free. And now we're doing it again. It's like, oh, look, there's a fire, ow, that hurts. Oh, look, there's a fire, ow, that hurts. This is a time where we need to be working out how we can actually start bringing bring in a sense of premium and you know professionalization. But we also need scarcity. And that's the reason why live is something that we pay so much for. If you miss your band playing in town, then you're going to have to wait for the next time they come and play in town. Not so with live streaming. Just tune in tomorrow when your band, favorite band is streaming all over again. So it's great that we've got all of this innovation, but we need a bit of structure to it. I'll just skip. So... This, if you're not familiar with this, this is the uh, Gartner's hype cycle. And it's basically all technology follows this cycle. When something new comes along and it's all bright and shiny, we all get super interested, loads of people invest, and there's all this great excitement. And then normally most of those companies don't make it. Um, there aren't follow-on rounds of investment. Everybody's expectations to the world to this is an absolute dud. So think 3D printing, Bitcoin, VR, whatever it might be. It's the next stage which gets really important. It goes into this trough of disillusionment, which always to me sounds a bit like a Radiohead album title. And then if it's going to make it, it will start slowly building up this slope of enlightenment. Um, uh, this quote has been attributed to Bill Gates. It may not be him, but let's just say it was Bill Gates, which is this saying that when thinking about the future, it is it's, I'm sorry, I'll get this. When thinking about the future, it is easy to overestimate the near term impact and to underestimate the long term impact. And that really is what this, you know, the hype cycle reflects. And this is where we are with virtual events. Everybody's thinking this can change the world. You know what? It will change the world, but it might take some time to change the world. And we may well see a huge amount of disappointment before we get to the stage where it does change the world. So I think what we need is uh, a proper structure around live events. I, I, what we think at Media, and we were working with a whole bunch of partners in the industry to try to make some of this happen, is we need there to be a virtual live circuit, you know, where we actually have some structure and some scarcity, where every city will have, you know, one or more of these virtual venues, and they'll have a particular capacity on them. So it's like a proper circuit. So you've got your 500 cap venue in you know in Mexico City and your you know your 3000 cap venue in Los Angeles and these become you know there's only a certain amount of uh, capacity in them so you know artists competing to be able to play that Wednesday night in Mexico City etc and produce them to a really high quality and think of it not as this sort of 
sticking plaster to get us through while the real live business is down. This is a new format. This is this could be to live music what TV has been to sports. Can turn it into this astronomically bigger thing by turning it into a completely televised, high production quality experience that can go anywhere. And this will help with the demise of small venues if we have this circuit of virtual smaller venues where you know emerging artists can begin to go and get you know get established. And um, we need to see innovation around the, the the experience though. So you know, a if we think about it as a new format, what you know, how do we do that? Does it look more like a TV show? Does it look more like an artist showcase? You know, th this is the t these are the things we should be experimenting on, not simply what are all the new business models. And we should also be thinking about how. Can we take so many of the things that work in the real live world and put those into the virtual live world? So you can pay for better seats at concert. You can pay for VIP. You can pay for a meet and greet. You can. All of these things can be translated into a digital environment. You know, imagine if you've got you, you can get, you know, buy a virtual badge that you can only get if you attended that concert or a virtual meet and greet where there's 20 of you do a live stream chat with the artist or your VIP ticket gets you backstage footage, it gets you extra camera angles you can toggle through. People want to spend to get as close as they can to their favorite artists. That's proven over the decades in live music. It just needs to be translated into a digital environment and then take that and go beyond. And um, the other thing as well, I think this is, let's just think about this as this isn't live. This is, it's not replacing concerts, it's creating a new format. It's creating a new stage. And that is really, I think, where you know the opportunity of, of live exists. So I'm keeping an eye on the clock. We've got 19 minutes and 26 seconds to go. So here we go into the, the, the next three. Fandom. So this is obviously something I spoke about at the Tectonics conference uh, last year. There's a panel coming up, Dimitri, uh, uh, prepped earlier on. There's a lot to say here and not a lot to say here. So. There's a lot to say in here, as in this is a massive opportunity and it's just as massive an opportunity as it was when I spoke last year. Where there's not a lot to say is there's still not a lot being done yet. There's some interesting companies, like Fanaply, I think it's Fanaply, how you pronounce it, and you know, a bunch of others which are you know, beginning to make interesting moves in this space. But it hasn't yet been embraced by artists, by labels, by you know, all the very streaming platforms, etc. And I think streaming platforms really should look at how they can embrace it before this opportunity goes somewhere else. Because of the, what we've done in the West with streaming is we have monetized consumption. You know, it's just become this thing. It's just, yes, you're paying to get instant access to music, great new songs tailored to your taste every day. It's a service, it's a utility. It's like water coming out of your tap. And in some ways that's diluting fandom. If you remember me talking about the slide of 10 minutes ago about there's a difference between hearing a bunch of new music and discovering new music, the problem with having this you know, sort of open tap pouring music at you is it's hard to go and specialize. It's hard to dive in and spend time with an individual artist or an individual body of work because you're so fast trying to keep up with all of this other new music. And so we're shifting music consumption away from this sort of like semi-monogamous relationship that we had with a small number of artists back in the days of, you know, albums and buying music into this almost like sort of turning music into, into Tinder where we're constantly swiping to the next artist and to the next artist. We need to work out a way to be able to enable artists and fans to build proper relationships. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not being a Luddite here. I am not saying let's turn back the clock and streaming. Streaming has been the single most important thing to have happened to the music business in a huge, huge amount of time. And it will remain an incredibly important part of the future of the music business. But there are things which have got broken along the way, collateral damage, if you like. And one of those is the artist fan relationship. So fandom is really, if you think about it, music matters to us all. And some music matters to us more than other music. Some music we like so much, we want other people to know we like that music. You know, we might wear a T-shirt, we might share a song, we might do these things, but there's so little that we can do in most Western streaming apps, SoundCloud and YouTube accepted, to actually go and express ourselves. Look into Asia, and there's a 
amazing amount of stuff that's going on that is all about not just enabling fandom, but monetizing that fandom too. You think about K-pop and the Japanese idol acts, but the Chinese streaming apps is maybe an even more direct analogy. You know, where the if you look at Tencent Music Entertainment, which is just the pure music spin out from Tencent, and look at its revenues, it makes something like twice as much revenue from non-music, not you know, not from the music itself than it does actually the music. And they might be things like virtual currencies, tipping, like paid live streams and paid uh, chats and a whole number of things, which are basically giving the fans a way to be that, fans, not just listeners. And that really is, I think, the opportunity to take streaming users from being listeners back into being fans. So there's loads of technologies out there. I mean, there's been, over the last couple of months, there's been a bunch of stories about um, NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, which is a really interesting way of creating scarcity in, uh, in, 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 in fandom products. I think this is, you know, with... I saw a whole bunch of the, you know, the, the the comment stream chats in the in the far side chat. Loads of excited startups about, you know, so like, oh, great, you know, how can I pitch, etc. Well, if you're looking for where the next big opportunity is in in in, in digital entertainment, I would say fandom is it because live streaming, yeah, it's going to be huge. It's going to take time. There's loads of structural issues, and there's loads of people chasing that now. Fandom, there's not many people chasing this at the moment. And just to finish on fandom. This is Xiaomi, which is a one of the smaller Chinese streaming services. And I've deliberately picked one of the smaller Chinese streaming services because this is table stakes. This is the bare minimum of what you need in order to be a streaming service in the Chinese market. You know, and this is the, all the various things on here. You've got the extra content. You've got the videos. You've got information about the artists. You've got live streams. You've got fans creating their own stuff. You've got internal currency and tipping. The whole idea is this is not just a here's a list of songs. It's have a whole world of engagement around the music. And yet Chinese consumers are different from the rest of the world. Absolutely. But it doesn't mean that this stuff can't export. I mean, you know, look at what Fortnite has done. We've got these dynamics happening in games. You know, we've got these dynamics happening even on YouTube. Uh, we've got the ability to take the essence of this and translate it into the Western market. OK, so checking my clock again, 14 minutes to go through why YouTube is going. It can be a growth driver. And then finally, my final flourish on creator tools. So YouTube. Let's forget for a moment that we've got all of this massive tension between rights holders and YouTube. It's not where it was. It's certainly, you know, things have improved. But if it were a Facebook pro, uh, Facebook status, it would be it's complicated. Take that aside for the moment and let's just think about what YouTube is in the music ecosystem. It is the most widely used music app on the planet. It is, uh, as you've seen from the slide uh, earlier on, it is the most widely used digital platform for discovering new music. Um, and it generates a really decent amount of revenue. Does it pay enough on a per stream basis, et cetera, et cetera? Probably not, but it generates really large amounts of revenue. However, that per stream payout it's not just about how much YouTube pays. It's about how well music is monetized within YouTube. So you can see in this chart what's happening. Total YouTube ad revenue is growing faster than music um, ad revenue is growing. And that is because we're seeing other sectors, other categories, uh, other categories growing uh, at a stronger rate. And that's partly because the music format of the four minute song doesn't work that well in YouTube monetization framework. If you are a YouTube gamer and you're putting out 20, 30, 40 minute videos three times a week, each one of those videos will give you maybe four or five mid roll opportunities as well as a pre roll and possibly a post roll. And you're putting them out three times a week. You're constantly monetizing and you're probably using the paid chat features. You're probably selling some merch there. You know, you, you might have Patreon, all these different things that you're doing to generate income from YouTube. A four minute pop song simply does not have the same opportunity. Now, you might say, well, that's just the nature of music. You know, there's not much we can do about that. But when we look at how the non Western music companies have been treating YouTube, they've taken a completely different approach. So, what we're looking at here is in order of subscribers, the 10 most subscribed music channels on YouTube. And 
as you can see, three of the top four are non-Western channels. Look at the number of uploads. So this is a tiny sample. I literally, I did this between the 1st of October and the 10th of October. This is the number of uploads that happened in that period. So T-Series, Conzilla, Z Music, 12 and 18 uploads just in that period. Compare that to Marshmallow, one. Compare that to Big Hit Labels, which is a non-Western one, but still it's only at three. So of the Western ones, the best we've got is one. All the others are zeros. And look at how long it was since it did the last uploads. So T-Series and Conzilla, both of them had uploaded just the day before. And yet here, Ed Sheeran, months ago now i know he's got b right back on his you know on his, on his profile there and you know he's out of cycle but it's arrogant to assume that you can simply just stop talking to your audience and expect them to come back and completely be you know just as engaged as they were when you left it's like if you don't call a friend for a long time and you finally call them yeah they appreciate you called them but they're also thinking why didn't we bother calling me before and that is really how labels and artists need to think about YouTube. It is a relationship that you are developing with your audience. It is not simply a platform on which you pump out a load of stuff and expect them to watch it. The other thing that some of these non-Western music companies are doing, they're creating longer videos. So uh, Z Music Company, one of those that was uploaded in that, you know, that 10 day period was about a 30 minute video, which was a collection of about half a dozen or more songs stitched together. Each of those that was around is a tribute to, to an actor, I think it was. So it had a theme around it. So it had a reason for existing. And each of those gaps was a chapter marker in which a mid-roll advert could go. So you've got six times a monetization capability in that one video versus simply putting out a four-minute song. There's loads more details of this, which I'm not going to go into. But, you know, the key takeaway here is music can do a way better job of monetizing on YouTube, regardless of what the royalty rate is. And non-Western music companies have got it in a way that Western music companies haven't. One last thing to leave you with on YouTube is YouTube has essentially become, through the one billion plus view videos, the platinum singles of the digital era. You know, so we, we've now got uh, about more 208 as a time of uh, right of this. So, you know, as of a week or two ago, 208 songs have made 1 billion plus views on YouTube. This is the new sort of mark of success. You see the rate on the left-hand side, the rate, the speed at which it takes to get to 1 billion views has, has you know, accelerated and is now hit a sort of, you know, getting pretty much to a sort of a, a standard average level. And we've seen a steady increase in the number that hit that. So this is a predictable, stable marketplace. The, you know, in, in a way that in some ways, so many of the other or the other streaming platforms don't have that same degree of predictability, and they certainly do not have that same amount of global view. So if there's one thing you take away from this, one billion views are the, are the streaming era's platinum singles. So to finish on um, Creator Tools, and I'm going to be a little bit um, cheeky here, I'm giving you a sneak peek. Why am I giving you a sneak peek? Because come along to Tectonics next week, and you're going to see the full research in all of its full glory. But this is just to give you a, a, an idea. And just so you know what we're talking about with Creator Tools. So in the scope of this work, this is things like um, uh, doors like Logic and FL Studio. It's plugins. It's VSTs, virtual synthesizers. It's sounds. It's collaboration platforms. It's really anything that's involved in the making of the music. And the reason why we think this is really important is twofold. One, we have got a transformation happening in this sector. You know, we heard a lot of conversation about Splice earlier on. Splice is absolutely right at the epicenter of this change. It is a, 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 an indication of what the future is going to look like. But we've also had lockdown. And what happened during lockdown? Everybody finding that they needed to start making music on their computer, even if they're playing guitar. If they were going to go and still that track they had to record it on garage band and share it with their friends and suddenly everybody's becoming a music producer and if you think about it the history of musicianship everybody can play well all musicians can play some musicians can write and then a tiny share of musicians can produce now that is changing where production is becoming core to the songwriting process 
So people are spending as much time focusing on the sonic structure of the music that they're making as they are on the chord progression and the and the melody. And this thing is why this dramatic transformation is happening because we've got a new generation of tools and services which are building for that generation of musician. So going back to the artist survey I was speaking about, this is what we're saying. So since the coronavirus outbreak, how are you changing music making and performance? And by the way, the sample in this, this is truly global. You know, we've got massive responses in sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East and North Africa, in Latin America, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, North America, everywhere is covered here. So this is a you know, truly global view. But the really interesting thing, look at, these are independent artists. So these are not artists signed to a label who are constrained by a label's release strategy, et cetera. And we know lots of labels early on in lockdown got really nervous. They held back releases because they thought it might get, you know, uh, hit hard by everything being so disrupted. These independent artists didn't think like that. They just spent more time making music. They spent more time collaborating. Uh, and this, you know, this idea of online collaboration, well, if you can't go to your rehearsal room and you can't play in a venue, then, yeah, hook up with, you know, not only the musicians you normally make music with, but loads of other new musicians as well. It's really what COVID has acted as is a changed catalyst. You know, this stuff was already in motion, but then COVID came along and massively accelerated. Yeah, we've been talking to pretty much all of the key, key companies in this space over the last few months. And so many of them, some of them have been around for decades, have been saying 2020 is going to be one of, in some cases, their best ever year. People have been rushing out, well, not rushing, their, their fingers have been rushing out to click, to get synths, to buy software, to buy, you know, to pay for services. People have just been spending and spending on making music. One of the things we've done is sizing out this market is really looking at the shift to subscriptions and the shift to subscriptions that can be anything from a supply subscription through to a subscription for uh, your, your, your. Um, there's a really important shift about subscriptions. Some of the big old traditional companies are just making their products available as a subscription. Becoming a subscription service is not just about a price point. It is about becoming an on-demand service. You've got to think of the way that Spotify and Netflix think. If you want to see a glimpse into the future of what subscriptions look like in creative tools, there's a fantastic company, I think based out of LA actually, called uh, Output. And they've got a product called Arcade, which is a true next generation um, uh, plugin. It's a $9 a month subscription. It's got this beautiful interface. It simplifies the making of music. It has some really powerful tools, but it just delivers new content again and again and again to make people feel that there is value in having that subscription. So this shift to subscriptions is important, not just because it taps into how the next generation of musicians make music, it creates an ongoing relationship with the, with the musician. And why does that matter? Because it is turning creative tools into the new top of funnel. If you are a record label of any scale, you will by now have some form of distribution company within your portfolio because you've identified it. it's the top of funnel it's where you see the hottest new talent It's how you engage with independent artists It's how you get the best hits first before anybody else does but actually when somebody hits send on their distribution platform of choice that's the end of a process not the start of a process the real start of the process is in the creation of it itself now in the old world Music creation was putting someone in a studio. That's a cost center for a label. Or it's somebody buying a piece of hardware or somebody buying a piece of software, which they pay a one-off and then download. That is just a transactional environment in which no relationship exists. But when we look at the likes of Landar and BandLab and Output and Splice and, all, and many, many other companies other than these, they're creating, so they're turning music making into a SaaS business model and a, a subscription relationship. So right now, there are not many companies out there who've understood that this is the new top of funnel. Spotify probably has. So Spotify's got sound better. Spotify has got sound trap. It's understood that having a relationship with the artist is a future of what being a music company is. So where's all the record labels are thinking, whew, thank goodness that Spotify backed off from trying to be a record label and letting artists distribute directly. What it hasn't realized is actually it's making the move for what tomorrow's record label is going to be. 
you know, there's a there's a saying which is you, you know you don't look at the player who's got the ball, look at the player who the, who's going to pass the ball to, and that is really where we're at with with creator tools. And then you look at the bottom, and there's Apple and Spotify. They both got creator tool assets. I've already mentioned Spotify's. Apple has got GarageBand and Logic, two of the most widely used doors on the planet. So they've got these foundations for leapfrogging over those middle bits to go straight to the artist at the top. And then, of course, you can start pushing down from the top as well. So Landar, a year or so ago, was only an online mastering company, but now has a, 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 a talent network. It's got um, rent to own VSTs um, and it's got a distribution arm as well. You look at BandLab. BandLab has about 30 million music listeners who go and, and listen to music then growing really quick every you know every month so you've got already examples of people pushing down from the top so really when we think about the future of the music business if you are a label or a distributor or a streaming service whether you realize it now or whether you realize it tomorrow the creator tools is going to be a crucial part of your ecosystem because this is where the real relationships with artists are made. Okay, I know I've covered a lot of ground there. There's a lot of things which you covered off. And uh, as always with my presentations, I've probably going to bewildered you with a bit too much information. But um, hey, that's my prerogative. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That was awesome. There were some questions who came in. Um, and there were quite a few, but I'll I, mind if I throw one or two to you real quick before we jump in. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, we have uh, Steve Mann asked, do you see streaming services as facilitating the connection to fandom? The trend has been lackluster data, no modern marketing functions, pic uh, pic pixels, UTMs. But Amazon does seem to have an eye here as per super fans and merch connections. Will Spotify become more Shopify anytime soon? Yeah, so I think, uh, let me focus on the Amazon bit of that, because I think Amazon is in so much of what it does, the one of the most in innovative companies in the space, uh, because it's doing things differently. It's not playing the same game as Apple and Spotify are, or, you know, or, or Deezer or, or Tidal, etc. It's going after, it's been unashamedly, we're going after older, more passive music fans. We're going after them in the home. We're trying to deliver an audio experience in the home. And think about, you know, they've moved into podcasts recently. They've got Audible, you know, all of these things that they could stitch together and the device which you can make behave like a radio behaves. I think they're really well placed to go and create this complete new audio experience for, you know, for, for more passive households. However, the whole thing about going after those more passive households is it's harder to build fandom in those. Uh, so that's why uh, Music Unlimited is so important because it's bringing a different type of consumer in. Um, they're obviously already within the Amazon ecosystem, but they weren't within the Amazon streaming ecosystem. So it's a really good way of, you know, bringing in those more, you know, more passionate fans. Um, in terms of what a label or an artist can do with these, uh, I would say, you know, you've got to look at where we are in the cycle. I think we are at the end of the beginning. You know, this is stage one that we've got through now, and it's like we've we've got the foundations. Once we start hitting saturation in the US and, and other markets, streaming services can stop focusing on growth, which is a huge, huge, you know, the, the whole organization of Spotify pretty much, you know, is built around growth and you know, as the other streaming services as well. And you start focusing about how do we keep hold of customers? How do we stop the other streaming services trying to steal them from us? How do we increase lifetime value? How do we get them to spend more? How do we get them to dive deeper? That's when we start seeing, okay, so what tools do we need to give artists and labels? What other things can we get uh, give to our, to our audiences? So I'd say this next 10 years should be where we think about what's happened up to now as we build the foundations for the house. The next 10 years we see the house built. Uh, I'm afraid I can't hear you, Dimitri. Mark, you're getting tons of great things over in the chats. People are super uh, positive and, and really enjoyed it. Lots of great compliments there. Thanks for coming in and doing this pre-commerce. But the truth is all your new research is coming at Music Tectonics next week, right? So thanks for, Absolutely. Thanks for playing the fandom engagement game with us here. <laughs> <laughs> and not only uh, giving us a great presentation of your current thinking, but also planting some seeds for some engagement next week.